We have now come to the book of Hosea in our study through the Bible. Very interesting prophet of God. God commanded Hosea to take a wife and then through the names of the children God sought to speak to the people of Israel. Finally, Hosea's wife became unfaithful. The last child that she bore for him, he called Loemi, which is not mine. It's not my child. She finally left him, took all of the beautiful things that he had given to her, bestowed upon her, And she went out and became a prostitute. But after a period of time, she was bereft of her beauty and of the blessings and the things that he had bestowed. Through her life of prostitution, she had been reduced to a slave. And the Lord said to Hosea, Now go and purchase her and take her back as your wife. So he purchased her from the slave market and restored her as his wife. And the Lord then began to speak to the nation of Israel through this whole experience, declaring unto Israel that she had been the bride that God had taken, his great love for her, how he had bestowed upon her so many wonderful things. Yet they failed to recognize that it was God who had given them the blessings. And they had prostituted them They'd used the things that God had given to sacrifice unto the pagan gods. And thus God would take away that which he had given. But how that God finally will come to Israel when she is so destitute and will redeem her and take her back again as his bride. God's. Glorious, unfailing love, how it is revealed through the book of Hosea. God, it might be said, was incurably in love with Israel. And though they had failed so completely, yet God's love never diminished. It never changed. And God promises in Hosea the glorious prophecies of these last days when he would make of Israel a nation again and would again reveal himself to them and the glory that shall yet be for these people for whom God has this undying love. How glorious it is to be loved of God. How good God is to us. But I'd like us to look this morning at the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, as God is speaking concerning the nation of Israel as he is making the parallel to this wife of Hosea. The Lord said, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof, and I will recover my wool and my flax that I gave to cover her nakedness. Here in this text, we discover 
How often people fail to recognize the source of their blessings. We need to remember, as James said, that every good and every perfect gift comes from God. You say, but wait a minute. He's talking about the corn and the oil. Did they not go out and plow the ground? Did they not plant the corn? And did they not gather the harvest? Oh, yes. They did plow the ground. They did do their part. They planted the corn. But unless God had sent the rain, unless God had sent the sunshine, they would have never gathered the harvest. You see, there are many times when people gather less grain than they sow. There are times of drought and times of famine. And the fact that their corn increased and the oil increased was the sign of of God's blessing upon them. It was the Lord who had given them the increase of their corn and of their wine. People so often say, well, I have worked hard for what I have. I grant that you have worked hard. You have been diligent. But pray tell, who gave you the help and the strength that enabled you to work so hard. You see, had God not helped you, kept you healthy, had God not given you strength, you never would have been able to work as you did. And so in reality, we must look to God. He is the one who has sustained me. He is the one who has given me the strength for labor. You say, well, I used my own mind, my wit to amass my fortune. I studied diligently the market trends and I invested at the right time and I sold at the right time and I was diligent in my study and in my preparation. Yes, but who gave you the brains? And... If you do have a special anointing in the area of intelligence, then beware because there is such a fine line between a genius and insanity. And geniuses always border insanity. No doubt Nebuchadnezzar was a tremendous genius. He designed and built that tremendous city of Babylon with the hanging gardens and all of the glory. And one day walking through the city of Babylon, looking at the hanging gardens and the glory and the magnificence of that city, he said, is this not the magnificent Babylon that I have built? And the Lord said, I'll show you just how much power you have. And the fellow went insane. His brain snapped. That fine line between genius and insanity was crossed. And the fellow went insane. And for seven seasons, he lived with the oxen out in the field, ate grass with them until his hair grew like feathers to cover his body, his nails like claws until he realized that it was God who gives power to whomever he will and that God is the one who finally, behind it all, is responsible for the success of a man. The failure to acknowledge God or to recognize God is always a very sad thing. You hear people boast. They say, well, I'm a self-made man. I'm just honoring enough when I hear a person say that to declare to them, yes, and you surely look like it too. <laughs> but it isn't true. None of you have made yourselves. 
David said, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Paul asked the question, what do you have that you have not received? Now, looking at the talents or the abilities or whatever that you might possess, what do you have but what you have not received? And then Paul said, if you have received it, then why do you boast as though you didn't receive it? Why do you go around so proud as though it was something from you or of you? We need to recognize that anything that I have that is of any value, any worth, I have received that from God. Talents, abilities, or whatever, it's come to me from God. Then why do I go around so proud and boast as though I had not received it from God, as though it was something of me? Take a look at your blessings. Take a look at the plus side of the column in your life. And it all came from God. Yet the Lord said concerning Israel, she didn't know that I was the one who gave her her corn and her wine and her oil. I'm the one that multiplied her silver and her gold. They failed to recognize the real source of the blessings that they had received. Now, the failure to recognize the source of the blessings led them to the tragic misuse of these gifts and blessings from God. For the Lord said, they offered these things unto Baal, the pagan god. They took the gold and they made little images and little idols. They took the wine and the oil and they offered it as sacrifices and oblations unto the pagan gods. Failing to recognize that these blessings have come to us from God caused them to then prostitute the blessings and use them for ungodly purposes. And so we often see people who have been talented by God, and yet they will use that very talent to promote evil. Maybe God has given to a person a great singing ability, a marvelous voice, and they use their voice to sing suggestive songs that debase people's minds. They take the talent that God has given them to sing. And yet they're singing words that should never come across a person's lips. What a tragic misuse of that talent. Maybe God has given to a person the ability to write. That power with words and the expression through words. And they use that ability to write. And they write filthy stories that inflame men's passions. Maybe God has granted to some of you that rare gift of beauty. But people take that beauty that God has given to them and they use it so often to entice others into a life of sin taking the very blessings of God and using them for profane purposes. It's tragic that a man will take the voice that God has given to him and use that voice to blaspheme God. Or that others will take that knowledge and that keen intellect that God has given them and they fine-tune it and train it to destroy others' confidence and belief in God. Taking the very things of God and using them against Him. 
You see, it is only God's great love and God's great mercy that allows you to even go on. How long would you feed a dog that viciously attacked you every time you went into the backyard? How long would you go on caring for and feeding a cat that would attack and try and kill your baby every chance it got? We see how merciful God is. We see how long-suffering God is. We see how patient God is, for he's put up with us. Though we've taken these beautiful, precious gifts of God and misused them, Yet God is so patient. God is so merciful. He allows us to go on. He continues to feed us. He continues to bless us, even though we have taken these blessings and have misused them in such a horrible way. Jeremiah said, It is the mercies of God that we are not altogether consumed. You know, it's only God's mercy that we're not totally wiped out. But in our text, we notice that the failure to recognize the real source of our blessings not only leads us to a misuse of those blessings, but will ultimately lead to the loss of those blessings. For the Lord said, Therefore I will return and I will take away the corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season. And so God says, Because they have not used these blessings properly, therefore I'll come and I'll take away the good that I have given, the blessings that I have bestowed. God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. There can come a time in your life, God allows you to go on and on and on, but there comes that point, that line, that God says, all right, that's it. He put up with the people in the time of Noah. He put up with all of their... filthiness, their profanities, their, their manner of living. He put up with them for years, but finally God said, all right, that's it. Noah, get in. And he shut the door, and that was it. And he said to Noah, look, my spirit isn't going to always strive with man. There comes a time when I've said, I've had it. It's enough. God said, I will return, and I'll take away the corn in the season thereof, and the wine and all. I, I will take away those blessings that I've bestowed. And so many people have found it true in their own lives, though they have been blessed of God, yet one day their health fails them. And God takes away that blessing of a strong, healthy body. Or God takes away that blessing of a good, sound mind. God takes away the blessing. They lose their business or their wealth. Or the, those things that God had given are now stripped from them and they find themselves naked, bare. Do not mistake the patience of God as blindness. Because God is so patient, People sometimes get the attitude, well, God doesn't really see what's going on. God really doesn't know what I'm doing. And they mistake the patience of God for blindness. Do not mistake the long-suffering of God as approval. Because God hasn't smitten me down already, because God hasn't stripped me already, I begin to think, well, maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God even approves of what I am doing. Because my life is continually blessed, I keep receiving more, and so maybe God is approving 
of me and of what I am doing. But that's a tragic mistake that many people make. Because God is so long-suffering, they think that God is actually approving of their evil. Do not mistake the mercy of God for weakness, that God is unable to do anything about it, that God is too weak to respond or to react to this flood of evil that has pervaded the world in which we live. God said to the church of Thyatira, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, I gave her space to repent of her evil, but she repented not. It's interesting, God always is so merciful. He gives a man space. God doesn't cut you off immediately. The swift sword of justice does not strike instantly. But God is merciful, and he gives a man space. I gave her space to repent, and he gives you plenty of space. He brings warnings. He brings little indications. And these warnings and these indications are just God's way of giving you space and saying, look, you better change, you better turn. God's giving you space to repent. But God said, she repented not, therefore I cast her and those that committed fornication with her into the great tribulation because they did not repent. God gives you space. God gives you time. God gives you the opportunity. And even this morning, it could be that God is giving you the opportunity once more to repent. But His Spirit will not always strive with you. There comes that time when God says, It's enough. It's finished. It's over. That's it. I'll now take away that which I have given because of the misuse of those things. You see, God is not under any obligation to sustain us. God is not our debtor. God does not owe us a thing. It is only the goodness and the grace of God that has sustained us this far. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us of this man who had an orchard and in it a tree that was not bearing fruit. And he said to the gardener, Cut it down. Why encumbereth it the ground? And he said, Oh, give me one more year. Let me work with it. And he cultivated it and he fertilized it and he cared for it for one more year. But when it continued not bearing fruit, he said, Cut it down. The Lord is saying, look, I'm doing all that I can to help you to bring forth fruit. I want your life to bring forth fruit. I've bestowed upon you these blessings. I've cultivated. I've blessed. I've done all of these things. But how long will God forbear? How long before God looks at your empty life and how long will God put up with your taking these things that he has given and your prostituting of them? How long will God endure your evil until he says, cut them down? Why do they encumber the ground? 
You see, God has been so good to us. God has blessed us. And it's important that we recognize that the source of the blessing is God. Lest we take these blessings and use them in a way to defile God. And thus, ultimately, we become bereft of those very blessings that God has given. How sad, how tragic, and how empty that life that has been stripped of God. Once blessed of God, once anointed, gifted, talented, now just that vacuous emptiness of a life stripped, all because they failed to recognize the true source of power, of blessing, of goodness. May we not be guilty. Shall we pray? Father, we do wish to acknowledge today our recognition of your blessings and of your goodness to us. God, you have been so good. So good to us. We look around our lives and, Lord, we see the blessings that you've bestowed and we realize that if it were not for your mercies, we would have been totally consumed. But rather than being totally consumed, Lord, we're totally blessed. Oh, how good you have been to us. And Lord, we acknowledge these blessings as from thee. But now, Lord, help us that we might use these blessings to praise thee and to glorify thy name. To bring others to thee. May we not be guilty, O God, as Israel, of prostituting these blessings and using them for vain purposes. But, O God, may we take that which we have given and use it for thy glory and for thy kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some of you today may be in that space that God has given. How much space only God knows. But I wouldn't presume upon it if I were you. But I would turn my heart over to God and turn my life over to God and take that which God has given and place it back in his hands and say, Oh God, you have been good, you have blessed. And I give to thee, O God, that which you have given to me, that you might use it for your glory. Imagine God giving good things and people using them for evil purposes. Such was the case in Israel. Such is the case in so many lives. Maybe you'd like to go back to the prayer room this morning. I would encourage you to do so if you so feel inclined. The pastors will be back there to meet with you and to pray with you. The prayer room is in the corner, the door that goes behind the block wall. Now may the Lord be with you and may his continued blessings be upon your life. And may you come to a greater awareness and consciousness of God's goodness to you. God's love for you and a greater appreciation of all that God has given that you might in turn use those things for his glory. And thus may your life be enriched for unto him that hath more shall be given. And as you use that which God has given to you for his glory, you'll find that God will then just make your life a channel and he'll begin to channel through you his glorious infinite resources. For God wants to reach this lost world around you. And he wants to use you 
as the instrument to do it. And thus he has talented you, enabled you, made you capable of certain things that you might in turn just give them to him to be used for his glory. So may God bless and may God use your life this week for the glory and the praise of Jesus Christ our Lord.